Hi, everybody. Great to be back here again. Um, now, before we begin, it's always good to kind of understand uh, kind of who's in the room. So firstly, um, who here has uh, is currently or has previously invested in investment property like buy to let? Just a show of hands, please. OK, brilliant. How many people in the room have invested in, uh, in uh, property backed loans? Anyone? OK, cool. Couple of people. And how many people have previously invested in real estate development projects? OK, so one or two. Brilliant. Um, so let me, let me just start by talking. I, I, I always like to think about the future. Where, where are we going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time? And to, to look at where the world is moving, we need to understand where we are today. And today, the one thing we know for certain is that wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, I think it said about 46% uh, of global wealth is held by 1% of the global population. And I don't know if a lot of people know this stat, but since 2020, over 60% of new wealth that has been created has gone to that 1%. So that's a bit of a problem. If that trend carries on, this is, how, this is why revolutions happen, right? So this is something that needs to be addressed. Now, I see the future slightly differently. In the future, thanks to the use of technology, wealth will be more widely spread. As people get more educated on the investment space, on financial products, they will be able to manage their own money better. And through the use of technology, we'll have more disintermediation. Because right now, let's face it, a lot of your uh, investment returns are being eaten up by fees. So this is where I see the future being. Now, when you consider, OK, let's say we can invest everywhere. Well, where should we invest? Um, now, the, the wealthy generally have access to opportunities that we as normal people don't have access to. And one of the biggest spaces is real estate. Now, property throughout history has been used as a prime place to build and, and uh, maintain wealth. The, you know, it, it really doesn't matter where you make your money. It could be in the health healthcare sector, it could be in the tech sector, it could be anything. But sooner or later, anyone who has any wealth ends up in real estate. So that's a good place to start. Now let's look at where those opportunities are in the UK. So let's look at today. Today, we are facing an acute shortage of housing in the UK. We're somewhere between 2.2 and 2.5 million homes short. And in a population of 70 million people, that's a lot. You know, if you exclude the, the young children and you assume, you know, you look at households, 2.5 million home shortage is a lot. And very simply, it's because we have not been building enough homes for the last 30 years. And our population is growing. So you've got a supply-demand imbalance. So anyone that looks at basic economics understands that supply-demand imbalance is an opportunity. It's terrible that there is a shortage of housing, but that's a fact. So now we've got to look at, well, what opportunity does that create for the astute investor? And if we can address that, that's a great opportunity. Now, why is there a shortage of housing? Well, it's two things. Firstly, obviously, we all know about the planning system, excuse me, and NIMBYism and all that in the UK. But there's a second reason, and that's simply a lack of access to capital. You know, most people think of mega developments like your Red Rose and Wimpies and Barrett. But actually, so much housing could be unlocked by small and medium-sized developers. And so if they had access to the funding that they needed, they could be building all over the place. They could probably address the housing issue. But the, the problem is most uh, funds don't want to look at small and mid-sized house builders. They, they need to deploy tens or hundreds of millions at a time. Look at your Blackstones when they're raising funds of eight to 10 billion at a time. They can't be giving out a few million pounds at a time to, to these small and mid-sized developers. But this is where the opportunity therefore lies. What about if they come to the people to raise the money, all of us? What if we invested in those development projects and we share the profits? Now, the interesting thing in that space is it's way more profitable 
than bigger developments. And I'll explain why in a bit. But that's the opportunity. And by, by providing the capital they need to develop the homes, we get the homes built, but we get to share the profits, the upside. And this is really where Shojin sits. We sit in the middle. We provide financing to these, what we call mid-market real estate developers and mid-market assets. So this is uh, projects between 10 and 60 million pounds. This is where we see the funding gap. And I'll explain more about that in a second as well. But once we've provided these loans or we've invested in, that, in, in those projects, we then turn around and we open this up to our global network of investors through an FCA regulated uh, digital investment platform. And through the platform, investors can invest anything from 5,000 pounds upwards. So we have family offices doing 2 million pounds per transaction, and we have regular investors doing 5, 10, 20, 50,000 pound per transaction. And it doesn't matter because everyone's treated the same. Everyone has access to the same opportunity. And that's therefore true democratization of this particular space, real estate development funding. Now, why the middle market? Well, everyone knows um, someone who may have done a small project, maybe taken a house and converted it to four apartments or something like that. When a developer starts developing and they're doing a small project, and if they're lacking the capital that they need, they can always borrow from friends and family and share the profits. But as they start doing bigger projects, that's where they outgrow their own network. That's where they can't raise funding anymore. And it's the same in the normal business space. Everyone's heard of this funding gap in the market, right? It's easier to raise 20 million pounds than to raise 2 million pounds. Because at the bigger end, all the private equity firms are there. And, and the private equity firms don't want to mess around with two, three, five million pound investments. They want to deploy 50 or 100 million pounds at a time. But this creates the opportunity. You see, because of the lack of funding available, the land values are lower in that space and the profit margins are much, much higher. And for an experienced developer with a great project, which in itself will be very profitable, the idea very simply is they would be willing to share the upside on that project. So they would be willing to give away 15 to 35 percent per annum in returns, which sounds absolutely crazy. But it's simple mathematics. If we look at a typical project, you know, let's take a 10 million pound project. You might have a senior loan of, say, 6 million pounds. That's from the bank. They'll be getting around 9 to 11% per annum. The developer has to put in 4 million pounds. But the developer doesn't have 4 million pounds. And this is where the opportunity comes in. The developer may only have a million pounds and they've got a three million pound funding gap, but it's a great project and it's profitable. Well, by lending to that developer, we can generate returns of, so I'm not sure exactly what's happened there, but it's uh, up to 75% of gross development value. It's about 10% per annum and 30, uh, something's happened there, sorry. That's 20% per annum. I'm not sure why that's changed. And that's 30 to 35% per annum. So you can see just by going from this space where the bank goes up to 65% loan to value, by lending a little bit more, you can generate returns of 20% per annum. But you know, let's face it, as, as an individual, where would you start? How would you even know how to invest into this space? And that's the beauty, that's where Shojin comes in, because we recognize that it would be great to open this up to everyone, but who's looking after the investor? Who's doing the due diligence on the project? Who's looking at the risks? And that's where we come in. We, we have a team of people that look at every project, we, we originate them, we do the due diligence on those projects. We get project deal flow from developers directly, from brokers, but most interestingly, interestingly from banks. Because when the bank can only go to 60%, let's say, but the developer needs 70%, the bank will call us and say, do you want to partner with us? And this is, this is where a lot of the best opportunities come from. We have a close working relationship with the banks and, uh, and therefore we find the, almost the gems, if you like. We do the due diligence, we do the structuring, we do the legal process. And then once we funded it, 
we then open it up to the investors. Investors can come in with as much or as little money as they like, for, uh, like I say, 5K minimum. We then monitor the project. We do the monthly um, site visits. We look at all the cash flows on the project and, and so on. And we report back to investors. So we are the eyes and ears on the ground on behalf of investors. So this is really completely passive from an investor's perspective and suits people that have other jobs, you know, young professionals, accountants, lawyers, doctors, nurses, you name it. Because here your money's working, but you're not having to actually do anything with it. It's completely passive and we are making sure that the project goes to plan. And then finally, once the project is done, typically projects are about two years. That's when everybody gets repaid their capital and all the interest that they've accrued during that time. So here are just some previous projects that we funded. Um, again, you can't look at previous projects to, uh, you know, to guarantee what the future will look like. But broadly speaking, we've got a great track record. We've been running since 2009. And um, it was mentioned briefly in the introduction, but I haven't fully introduced myself. So I spent about uh, over a decade with UBS Investment Bank in Structured Solutions. My co-founder's background was in construction, and that's how we've come together in the real estate and finance space. So we've got that perfect combination. We've also done our own developments and construction. So in the early days, we used to do our own projects before we realized other developers have this funding problem, and that's where the business has moved. Uh, today, I mean, we, like I think I mentioned earlier, we have investors all over the world, about 50 countries, um, and, uh, and, and uh, really we have all sorts of investors. You don't have to be a family office with tens of millions to get into this space. You can be a regular investor, although due to new FCA rules, you have to be what's called high net worth or sophisticated. So high net worth is you have to have over £100,000 in annual income, or over £250,000 in investable assets, funds. It could be invested in, already invested in other places. Doesn't mean you have to put 250 into this. Um, or you have to be sophisticated, which means you've got to have some sort of prior experience either in the real estate or finance markets. Maybe you work for, a, you know, in the finance industry or something. So you have an understanding of the risks involved. Also, um, uh, there used to be the ability to do, uh, to invest even if you weren't in those categories. That has changed recently. There is um, a lot of lobbying going on to reverse that change, but for the moment, the FCA has uh, considers the, uh, these type of investments too risky for smaller investors, which is a shame. I think it's wrong, but you, know, you can lose your money in the casino, but you can't invest in something sensible. So go figure. Um, and interestingly enough, we get a lot of investors that come out of the buy-to-let space. And, and I asked earlier, and I know quite a few of you were in the buy-to-let space. I was in the buy-to-let space. Today, I would not go into that at all, right? No way. In fact, if anybody wants to buy my portfolio, it's for sale. Take it, right? It's a pain. Costs have gone up. Regulations have gone up. Taxes have gone up. It no longer makes sense. So that's why, you know, but, but yet we all know real estate still makes sense. You know, you, people need somewhere to live. So there are better ways to invest through platforms like Shojin, whether you're investing into the development projects themselves or um, when we acquire assets, we acquire entire assets, like could be a student accommodation block with 200 apartments, because there you can generate better returns with lower risk and less hassle uh, compared to buy to let. So we're seeing a lot of movement of people coming out from buy to let. The other thing I should mention is, and because we always get asked this question, uh, people can invest through things like ICES, SIP, SAS, companies, trusts, you name it. And, um, you know, how do you get started? So it, it's, it's very, very simple. Go to the website and register. That's your step one. Once you register, you can access all the educational material, the videos, You'll get notified of webinars. Um, and, and, but the only thing is at that point, you are, are unable to see the projects because you haven't done the appropriateness test. This is another FCA requirement. To unlock the project pages, you have to do an appropriateness test, which tests your understanding of the risks involved. And you have to certify as either a high net worth or sophisticated. Then that unlocks all the projects. When you unlock, once you unlock the projects, you get to see all the full investment memorandum of all the various projects. You get to see the videos and you can go ahead and invest directly through the platform. We also we have a lot of webinars, um, so you know, feel free to join them. You know, some people just sit on the sidelines and watch for a while. 
And then when you're ready, you know, you, you come on board. There is absolutely no, no reason to rush into something because we always have new opportunities coming up. Um, so this is really what we call next level investing. Uh, we consider this to be the future of investing. As I said right at the start, I see the future being one where wealth is more broadly spread, where everyone can access the same opportunities. So, you know, Shojin is really doing its part in making that a reality. Mm -hmm.